by uh, Orange County. And they uh, have the study plan and workbook that's in here. This is really nice. Um, and they have left this available, I made this available to all of you as well. So um, you can uh, use that as you see fit. So anyway, this is, I'm not gonna go over everything in here. I just wanted you guys to see what was in this, um, what's in here. And so every week, I would encourage you to just go ahead and look and see what's in the study guide and, um, and let's see what's in the Google Drive for that week and see if there's anything that's useful for you. Okay, and I am um, in midway, you see a blank screen up, I'm just changing slides, so fear not, you'll be able to see in a sec. So this is um, chapter one. Um, before I get started, I'm just gonna make sure, um, does anybody have any questions in here? Uh, just seeing your contact information slide. Okay, yeah, so are you seeing, yeah, you guys are seeing the identification of the infectious disease process slide. Oh, so I can, uh, Monica asked the question, um, any guidance, direction on how to get on the Google Drive? Yes, yeah, so I will send the link to the Google Drive out. I sent it out to everyone um, with the invitation, the calendar invitation but I'll send it out to those of you that are on the call today, and you should be able to get in. You might have to open up, if you don't have a Gmail account, you might have to do that, and a lot of, um, a lot of our uh, workplaces do not allow us to open this, um, open this up at our work. I can't open the, um, I can't get in there and download anything when I'm in work. I can, op I can look at it, but I can't uh, interact in there. But um, if you open it from home and you have a Gmail account, that should be fine. Okay, so I have the book. So um, this is chapter three of the certification study guide. On the actual exam, um, there'll be 22 questions that cover identification of infectious disease process. Uh, so this is a main content area. And uh, what we'll do is we'll go through the questions one at a time and I'm gonna, um, I am going to uh, read the question and then we'll do the poll everywhere and we'll look at the responses. If there's a lot of discrepancy with the responses, we'll read the rationale and uh, then go from there. Okay, and good, we're, we're doing pretty well. So the first question, a patient was just admitted to a long care facility from the local hospital. The patient is being treated for psoriasis. The psoriasis does not appear to be responding to treatment, and 48 hours later, the infection preventionist receives a report that a certified nursing assistant has developed an itchy rash. The patient's physician, physician visits and determines that the patient has crusted scabies and not psoriasis. Another name for crusted scabies is A, American scabies, B, Norwegian scabies, C, Canadian scabies, and D, English scabies. Okay, and I can see folks answering on the chat box. That's great. We'll go to the next slide and it will give you the chance to, um, those of you who are on poll everywhere, you can go ahead and answer. Okay, so it looks like most of you got the right answer. The correct answer is, um, in fact, Norwegian scabies. I did not know the answer to that question when I first took the test, so I uh, was studying, so I looked it up, um, and this is a picture of the difference between the two different kinds of scabies. So the picture on the right is just your regular scabies, and you can see the little track um, marks in the skin. Um, crusted scabies, and this is really a, a, probably an extreme picture of this. I've never seen this in real life. I just pulled this off the internet. But you can see how um, this exudate on the skin and uh, the little uh, lines, the little tracks for, for the scabies are, are really uh, dug in there. Um, but for some folks who might have uh, scabies, this kind of scabies, um, you know, you could see how it could be confused with psoriasis. Okay, and then this is just a little tip. There's a lot of questions about scabies on this test. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So they're definitely worth reading the guidance about scabies. And those of you who do infection prevention probably get a lot of calls about scabies, um, uh, that people are very concerned about that. So question two, guidelines for transporting specimens include, one, transport within two hours of collecting a specimen, two, transport in leak-proof specimen containers and sealable leak-proof bags, Three, transport specimen in the syringe used to collect it. And four, refrigerate all specimens prior to transport. Your choices are, and you have two of these are correct, A is one and four, B is two and three, C is one and two, and D is three and four. Okay, I'll give you guys a second to answer. Okay, those of you with the poll everywhere, go for it. Okay, so the correct answer is, and I think I can show it on this thing. So the correct answer is C. So most of you said C, so that's great. And those of you answering the chat box, it was between B and C. Um, so the correct answers here were one and two, which is transport within two hours of collecting a specimen and transport in leak-proof um, specimen containers and sealable leak-proof bags. So um, number three uh, is not correct. And um, uh, you don't want to ever send anything in a syringe used to collect it. And then number four, um, I would caution you about for where it says all to really when there's a response that includes the word all or never or none or really um, uh, limiting um, your, you know, that it would never happen, think twice about choosing that. It seldom is anything all or none. Um, so I think I do have a little bit of information about specimen handling. So you never want to, so this is an example where never does apply. Uh, you would not want to ever refrigerate spinal fluid, genital eye, or internal ear specimens as these samples may contain temperature sensitive microbes. And so as our laboratory testing changes, um, you know, we have new tests available. There, are there may be different um, requirements for uh, packaging specimens. So, which is, which is uh, true about a tuberculin skin test, or TST? A, positive TST indicates active tuberculosis infection. B, negative TST rules out active TB infection. C, positive TST indicates past exposure to TB. And D, negative TST indicates past exposure to TB. So if I'm going too fast or too slow, don't be afraid to um, write that in there and I'll, I'll uh, try to um, do better. Okay, on the phone, most of you are saying um, um, C, but I shouldn't give that away until you guys have a chance to answer. Okay, so the correct answer is in fact C, a positive TST indicates past exposure to TB. So um, the TST, I'm just going to read a little bit about that, um, involves the injection of purified protein derived from the mycobacterial cell wall. The test relies on the fact that persons who've been infected with TB will have a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction to this reagent. The TST is a screening tool to detect people with latent TB infection. It cannot be used for ruling in or ruling out active TB. This is because a positive TST merely indicates a history of latent TB at some time in the past. It conveys no information regarding the current status of the person's infection, which may even have been cured previously. Likewise, a negative test does not rule out active TB because people with active tuberculosis, tuberculosis may well have a negative TST, even in the presence of positive control. In fact, up to 20% of persons with active TB will have negative TST results. That's interesting, right? Yeah. That's, okay. 
So um, this is just a summary. TST is a screening tool. 20% of with active TB will have negative TST results, and TB is diagnosed. When you diagnose it, it's diagnosed in the patient with an abnormal chest X-ray and sputum specimen with positive AFB staining followed up by a culture. Okay, another question about TB. The optimal time to collect a sputum specimen for acid fast bacilli testing to rule out TB would be A, first thing in the morning, B, after a respiratory treatment, C, prior to the patient going to bed, D, prior to a respiratory treatment. Everywhere will let you answer. Oh, yeah, no, I know it. I let people have a little leg time because I don't want them to everybody to <laughs> no. know one answer. <laughs> but thank you, Joanne. All right, so that means I should just advance that uh, slide a little faster. Okay, so the answer to this question is A, uh, first thing in the morning. Okay, so again, TB diagnosis is. Um, pulmonary disease is the most common form of TB. Um, so again, a uh, patient would have an abnormal chest X-ray or respiratory complaint, such as a cough. Um, you would send the sputum for AFB staining and culture, and usually um, you send three specimens sent on three spe separate days first thing in the morning. Um, many um, facilities will have respiratory and juice the sputum first thing in the morning um, to get a really good specimen. You only need one positive um, to re is required for the diagnosis. Okay, question number five. A hospital has hired a new manager of the microbiology section of the lab. During the initial discussion with the manager about the infection prevention and control program, the IP stresses the importance of collaboration between the departments in reducing healthcare-associated infections. Of the choices below, which activity will best meet this goal? A, the microbiology staff's compliance with the annual flu vaccination program and TB skin testing. B, the microbiology staff's participating in the periodic infection prevention educational sessions for hospital staff. C, microbiology's prompt notification to the infection prevention and control department of any organism's unusual resistance pattern. And D, the microbiology manager's attendance at local, state, and or national infection prevention and control educational conferences. I'm looking at Joanne. I'm not going to put her on the hot seat. <laughs> All right, I'll go to the next slide so that you guys can uh, do your poll everywhere. Okay, yeah, jo Joanne was making, Joanne knows sign language, and now <laughs> I'm learning sign language too. Okay, so you, you guys all chose C, which I believe is the correct answer. Um, yes, yeah, C. Uh, so this is a microbiology lab is an important partner in the practice of infection prevention. The active involvement and cooperation of the micro lab is critical to the functioning of the infection control program, particularly in surveillance and the use of lab services for epi purposes. Surveillance requires high-quality lab data that are timely and easily accessible. CDC um, recommends that all healthcare organizations establish systems to ensure that clinical microbiology laboratories promptly notify infection control staff. So this is particularly useful for long-term care, right? Um, so that uh, your lab is calling uh, the infection preventionist in the nursing home with any unusual, uh, any unusual. Um, result patterns. And I think that uh, the relationships in hospitals with IPs and microbiology departments, um, probably they're among our strongest stakeholders. Okay, number six, the primary immune response after exposure to a communicable disease pathogen or vaccine is production of immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin A, or IgC, so I'm not going to try to say immunoglobulin anymore. <laughs> IgG, IgM, IgA, or IgC. Okay. 
All right, so the answer here is um, B, but, but many of you are choosing A as well. So the most popular answer was definitely B, but about 25% of you, um, uh, including the, uh, the chat box, uh, chose G. So how to remember this? So IgM and IgG are both very important um, immune response indicators after exposure to a communicable disease. So IgM is the first one in the acute phase of an illness. So when you see these, and they ask about these because it's confusing, um, think M for making. And if anybody else has another way that they remember this, so this is when your body is developing a response, so it will be early and um, in the response. So the primary immune response after exposure or the first response is going to be IgM when the body is making antibodies. IgG, you can think about the G as um, meaning gone. So the disease, the patient has been infected and the active disease is gone. Um, they're no longer symptomatic, they're symptomatic but they have... Um, they have evidence of immunity. And so that will be um, represented in IgG. So some folks use that like as um, grandfather too, like old. So I've heard people say that. And um, Kimberly, as uh, Kimberly Malcolm is saying M, like in the minute. So think of it for sooner. So any way that you can think about to keep these separate, because I know that this is confusing. And when you're taking a test, sometimes like trying to remember it hard. So using those um, those tricks. I don't know what that means. Let's go away. Okay. When are IgM antibodies to hepatitis A virus detectable in the blood? A, 30 days after exposure. B, 5 to 10 days after exposure. C, 1 to 4 days after exposure. D, 15 to 20 days after exposure. Looks like um, B's and C's, and I'm getting carried away without going to pull everywhere. Okay, and get some D's. Okay, so um, there is so uh, first of all, if you don't know the answer to this question, and what is the answer to this question? Um, it is B, uh, which most of you did get, but um, several of you didn't know the answer. I don't want you to feel bad about that because this is something you would look up. You know, this isn't something you would ever, and I'm looking at Joanne, like with these things, unless you're working really closely only with a, with hepatitis, that you might not have them memorized. So um, five to 10 days after exposure or within three weeks of exposure and are present at the onset of jaundice. So that's the early phase of, of um, when you're gonna see IgM antibodies to hepatitis A. Um, this is one of the things I think you should definitely spend some time uh, trying to memorize is about hepatitis, all the different hepatitis, sorting them out um, and figuring out the different testing methodologies. This is an area uh, where it's definitely worth putting in some time. So um, serologic diagnosis is necessary for the diagnosis as clinical features of infection are not specific to AM hepatitis A. So all the hepatitis look the same basically. Okay, the incubation period for pertussis in, in immunocompetent persons is usually A, 7 to 10 days, B, 3 to 5 days, C, 1 to 2 days, and D, 2 to 4 days. So yeah, most of you got this one. It's A. There's um, uh, a lot of folks on the on the line also chose um, B and D. So let's see um, the range for the incubation period for pertussis is uh, six to 21 days. Um, there is a chapter in um, the APIC text that's worth reading about pertussis as well um, because it's post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, that uh, you know they, they may ask about as well on the exam, and that's all there too. 
So these are areas where public health folks have, a, and employee health people have a lot of um, strength because they're answering um, these questions in the course of their day-to-day -day job. Okay, number nine, a patient who was hospitalized for two days calls three days after discharge complaining that he has developed healthcare